Well, I um, have been very excited about the opportunity to share with you today because God's been doing some really great things in my life in the last six months. Um, I, I've been going through just a real process of refining, I think, that God has been taking me through. It all started back in January when I was asked to teach an hour and a half segment of the Discover Your Gifts class that we offer here at the church. On the Myers-Briggs personality type, which I've done training on for the last number of years, and so we added that to the class. After doing the class in, in January, we got together and decided that we needed something more. And the class has actually evolved into a day-long seminar where we are using more of a holistic approach to helping people understand how God has uniquely designed them for a specific kingdom purpose. And you see, this whole concept of a kingdom purpose is a passion that God has just been growing in my heart since January, just burning it there. And I am excited about the opportunity to talk with you about our kingdom purpose today. So I'd like to open us up in a word of prayer. Jesus, I just thank you so much for this passion that you have given to me. But Lord, it is your passion. And so this morning, I just want to give it back to you and say, Lord, share this with your body. Lord, I pray that you will prepare the hearts that are here, Lord Jesus. And I pray that you will take this message and minister to them in the way that you see fit for what their needs are, Lord. I just ask that you will use the words that I say and the things that I share to make this passion, this message that you have for your body real today. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You know, one of the things that was also very exciting to me is uh, the sermon that Greg preached last week. I emailed him after it was done, and I said, Greg, you set me up so great for the message I want to preach next week. Um, if you weren't here, Greg preached a sermon, which he entitled, Just a Nobody from Nowhereville. And he, of course, was preaching on Luke, yes, chapter 1. It was the story of the angel who came to Mary and said, Mary, you have been chosen by God for a specific purpose. You are going to be the mother of the Messiah. And Mary's response was, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. She was willing. Simply, she was willing. She was called by God for a specific purpose, and she was willing. Greg talked about the fact that God doesn't always work in ways that we expect. Mary wasn't the most righteous, nor was she the most important person. She was really a nobody from Nowhereville, Nazareth, is like Nowhereville. Nobody really had heard of Nazareth, and those people who had heard of Nazareth thought of it as the small town that was insignificant. It's kind of like the town where I grew up. I grew up in southern Wisconsin, small town, Clarno. Anybody ever heard of it? No, nobody's from Clarno. Small town, one street, five houses, you know, that kind of a thing. Well, that's what Nazareth was like. And Mary, she was from Nazareth. Nothing special, but she was willing. You see, the kingdom of this world has certain expectations. They want things to look a certain way. They expect certain skills, certain abilities. And the kingdom of God is actually backwards from that. And that's what Greg was talking about that. Last week he said, the kingdom of God, in the kingdom of God, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. The exalted will be humbled and the humbled will be exalted. It's really the poor who are rich and the rich who are poor. It's a backwards kingdom. And you see, a young peasant girl can start the whole thing off by simply saying yes to God because she had a kingdom purpose. And you see, we all have a kingdom purpose. You have been uniquely designed and uniquely made by God for a specific purpose. There are no nobodies in the kingdom. And that was Greg's point last week. And so I would like to build on that and talk a little bit more about what our kingdom purpose is. I've titled this message, What Was I Born to Do? A question that all of us have probably asked ourselves at one time or another in our life might have looked a little bit different. Why am I here? What is God's purpose for my life? And I think we need to take a look at Scripture to get some answers to those questions. So, if you would like to turn to Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to start there. I'm going to be bouncing around with a lot of Scriptures today. So I hope that I don't lose you, but it'll be on the screen. Ephesians chapter 2. I went out this week and actually purchased my first TNIV Bible so I can be using the same version that Greg uses. Today's New International Version, I guess, is what it is. Ephesians 2, verse 1. 
As for you, you were dead in transgressions and sins, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of the world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. You see, as unbelievers, we were bound by this world. We are pulled by our sinful nature in the ways of this world. We really have no purpose. We really have no meaning. Without Christ, there is no purpose. But let's go back here to verse 4. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. Jumping down to verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. You see, we have been redeemed by his great mercy as a demonstration of God's grace. We have been redeemed from the ways of this world and brought into the kingdom of God. But you see, beyond just being a demonstration of God's grace, there's more to the story here. Let's look at verse 10. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. You see, we have been redeemed for a purpose. When I look at this verse, the first let words, the first phrase of this verse, for we are God's handiwork. When I think of the word handiwork, I think of an artist or, or, or a craftsman. That's the kind of picture that comes to my mind when I hear handiwork. I'm not an artist or a craftsman, but for the last year I've been playing around with a little bit of pottery, trying to do, I have a wheel in my basement and I've been trying to do a few pots here or there. Most of them have been lousy, but every once in a while I'm able to create a piece that really represents who I am. It kind of like has a little bit of me in that piece. It looks beautiful to me, maybe not to anyone else, but it looks really beautiful to me. And it's my handiwork. So when it's done, I turn it upside down and I write APO on the bottom of it because I want to mark it because it's my handiwork. It's, it's got a piece of me in there. And while it may not be perfect to you, to me, it's got a little bit of me in it. And you see, the thing of it is, is when we talk about the fact that we are God's handiwork, I think of it, we have a designer label. We have a master designer who has uniquely designed us, and we have a designer label made by Jesus Christ, created by Jesus Christ, is written all over us. We are his unique design. And we are his handiwork for a purpose. We are created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God has prepared in advance for us to do. And so the question comes then, how do I find out what God has prepared for me? How do I find out what my purpose is? And you see, there is no formula and there is no secret. I can't give you a recipe that's going to help you find what God's purpose is for you because he's uniquely designed you. You are unique. You are his creation. You have unique experiences. You have a unique personality. You have a unique calling. And so the process, the journey that you need to walk through is going to be unique to who you are. But I think by looking at three stories in Scripture, we'll be able to get a sense through their stories, through their mission, how they found their mission, how they walked their path to fulfill their mission. Maybe we can glean some insights that will help us on our journey. So I have three examples that I want to take a look at today. The first one that I want to look at is Jesus. Now, Jesus had a mission. Most of us wouldn't question that. Jesus' mission in John 10.10 is... I have come that they might have life and have it to the full. That is Jesus' mission in a sentence. If all of us could get our missions in a sentence, wouldn't that be wonderful? This is Jesus' mission. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. He brought life. He brought abundant life. Everything he did while he was on this earth was about bringing life. When he healed the sick, when he raised the dead, it was a life-giving act. When he was teaching, he was teaching a message that was countercultural. It was a message that brought life to people who were without life. He breathed life on the crowds of people that heard his message. Even when he was confronting the Pharisees and the enslaving laws and religious systems of the day, he was giving them a unique message, a different way of looking at things. It was a life-giving message. Ultimately, his death on the cross 
was about life. He defeated death so that we might have life. Not only eternal life, but life to the full right now. That was Jesus' mission, and he fulfilled it in everything that he did. Now, of course, Jesus, he would have a mission. He came to this earth for a specific purpose. But it had to be easier for him than it is for us, right? No. Jesus faced so many obstacles. And I think from looking at the mission of Jesus and the path that he walked, we can learn what is my first point, that we need to stand firm against the obstacles. I would like you to turn to Matthew chapter 4. We're going to look at one of the obstacles that Jesus faced. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. We're going to break it down here just a little bit. This is the story of when Satan came to tempt Jesus. It was at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, before he actually began any public ministry. Satan came to try and thwart him off of his mission. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit to the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, People do not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. You see, the first way that Satan tried to get Jesus off track from his mission was attacking him when he was weak. He hadn't eaten for 40 days and 40 nights, so he tempted him with food. You see, Satan will do the same thing for us as we're walking through trying to find the mission, the, fulfill the purpose that God has for us. He's going to knock us when we're down and hit us at our weakest point and attack us in our, weakest, our weaknesses. Let's read on here. Verse 5. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand at the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down, for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you. And they will lift up their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered him, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to test. You see, at this point, Satan was challenging Jesus' identity. If you really are the Son of God, then just throw yourself over the edge and the angels will protect you. The angels will care for you. He was challenging Christ's identity. In the same way as you are trying to fulfill your kingdom purpose, Satan will challenge your identity. You're not really a child of God, redeemed by grace. Look at what you've been doing. How can you fulfill that kingdom purpose that God has for you when you're living like that, when you are struggling with that? But you see, that is a lie from the pit of hell because Scripture says that we are redeemed by grace not by works so that no one can boast. It is by his grace that we have been redeemed. But Satan will try and attack your identity in Christ. And we need to get back on track and look to Christ for our identity. Let's look at verse 8, because Satan doesn't stop. Twice down, here he comes back again, a third round. The devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. All this I will give you, he said, if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said to him, Away from me, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. You see, Satan was trying to confuse Jesus' mission. He knew he had come to redeem the world, but maybe there's another way I can twist this around and confuse you. You don't necessarily have to die to save the world. I'll give it to you. All you got to do is bow down. So Satan was trying to confuse his mission. And in the same way, Satan can try and get us off track get us pulled by diff this way or that way within the world. The ways of the world, the pull of this culture can be so enticing and can really get us off track of what God has for us and pull us in. But Satan will try and confuse our mission, and we need to stay focused on what God has for us. Stand firm against the obstacles. But you see, it wasn't just Satan. It wasn't just Satan that came against Jesus in his ministry and his ability to, to fulfill his purpose. Let's take a look at Mark Chapter 3. This is again at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. He just started to do some miracles, just started to do some teaching, just getting started in his ministry. And in Mark chapter 3, verse 21, it says, When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, 
For they said, he is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebub. By the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. You see, you'd kind of expect the resistance from the Pharisees. Jesus' message was a little bit countercultural, kind of coming against the norm of the day. But his own family, they were coming to have him committed. They thought he was insane. And they were going to take him and have him committed. This is his family. You know, and that that's the odd thing about when we go to fulfill the, the purposes that we have in Christ, we can hit a lot of obstacles. And sometimes they come from unexpected places, like our family and the people who are closest to us. You see, even Jesus' followers did not necessarily understand his mission. They didn't comprehend it. They expected him to kind of come and free them from the Roman rule. Many of his disciples thought that was his mission. They didn't really fully understand what he had come to do until after he had died and rose again and made himself clear to them. So you see, Satan's attacks, pressures from and the expectations of this world, expectations that our families put on us for what they expect out of us, what they want us to be, and expectations of others in the world, your boss, all of those kinds of things are pressures, the pull of the culture to say this is what you should be. This is what defines success. This is what defines success, is the message that we get. And that is an obstacle to what God has for us. So we need to stand firm against the obstacles. There's a second story that I would like to talk about for our second example, and that's the story of Ruth. You can turn to Ruth in chapter 1 in the Old Testament. We'll go there in a minute. I think that the message that we can learn from Ruth, the example that she demonstrates to us, is being true to how God made you. And I think that's an important piece as we make this journey to our mission. Ruth, her mission was to love and be present for another human being. That was her mission. And that becomes clear as we read more about her story. She was a Moabite woman, and she was married into an Israelite family that was living in Moab. And the story is a lot about her relationship to her mother-in-law, Naomi. And Naomi really experienced a lot of tragedy. While she was living in Moab, her husband died. And that's tragic enough, but in addition to that, both of her sons were killed, including Ruth's husband and then the other daughter-in-law, Orpah. So Naomi was living alone in a country that was a foreign country with her two daughter-in-laws, Ruth and Orpah, and she didn't know what to do. So she determined that she would return home, back to Israel. And that's where we're going to pick up in Ruth, chapter 1, verse 8. Then Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord show you kindness as you have shown kindness to your dead and to me. May the Lord grant each of you that you will find rest in the home of another husband. Then she kissed them goodbye and they wept aloud and said to her, We will go back with you to your people. But Naomi insisted that they return to their homes because she knew that in that culture of that day, in order to fulfill your purpose as a woman, you need to be married. You need to go back to your home, back to your families, and find another husband. That is your purpose. And so she insisted that they go back. Let's pick up the story in verse 16. But Ruth replied, Don't urge me to leave you or turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, your God my God. When you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. When Naomi realized that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped urging her. Because you see, Ruth knew that her mission, in order to fulfill it, she needed to be with Naomi. A conviction, she had a conviction of what she was born to do. Her mission was to love and be present for Naomi. And it was a countercultural mission. Naomi wasn't going to have any more sons for her to be able to be married. She was going to Israel to a strange land with her mother-in-law just to love her and to be present with her. You see, sometimes I think we get caught up in the fact that our missions need to be something spectacular. Something, we look at other people and we see them doing these great things for the kingdom and that's what my mission should be. But you know what Ruth shows us? Ruth shows us that our mission just needs to be true to how God has designed us. It's not, spec not doesn't need to be spectacular. It's actually more than the spectacular because it's being true to how God has made you. And that's what Ruth demonstrates for us. 
there are no nobodies in the kingdom. We all have a mission. We all have a purpose. And it needs to look like God has designed us. Ruth didn't change any geographical boundaries. She didn't perform any miracles. She didn't lead the multitudes. She simply loved with all of her hearts and gave herself in service to Naomi. And that was her mission. In fact, the mission was so dramatic that she's actually one of three women that's mentioned in the genealogy of Christ in Matthew uh, chapter 1. And you know what? Ancestors, female ancestors weren't mentioned in genealogies in those days. But Ruth made such a difference. She made such an impact by her simple mission and just doing that that she was actually mentioned in the genealogy of Christ as an ancestor to Christ. Our third example is the story of Joseph. And so if you want to, you can turn to Genesis 39. That's where we're going to be moving to next. Now Joseph was a man who experienced a lot of life struggles. Joseph had a lot of ups and downs. But he continued to be who he was, to use the talents that God had given to him in whatever context he was in. So I'd like to look at his story because I think the message that Joseph can share with us about our mission is that we need to persevere through life struggles. And as we look at his story, I think we will see Joseph persevering through life's struggles. Joseph started out as the favored son. He was his dad's favorite. His dad loved him so much that he gave him an ornamental robe. Many of us have heard it called the coat of many colors. To be able to be a symbol of the love and the favor that he showed to Joseph. Well, his brothers were furious about it, and they hated him for it. And so one day, his father sent Joseph out into the field to meet his brothers. His brothers saw him coming from a distance and saw him coming and plotted against him. They decided, we're going to kill him. Here comes the dreamer again. Let's get rid of him. Let's get him out of our life. And so Joseph, when he came up there, was attacked by his brothers. They took his coat and threw him down into a cistern. They were plotting to kill him, but instead they saw some Midianite traders come along and so they traded him into slavery for Egypt. So they sold him to these Midianite merchants and these merchants then took him into slavery in Egypt. They took his coat of many colors and they killed a beast, spread his blood on the coat and took it back to his father and said, see, Joseph has been killed by a wild animal. And Joseph went on to Egypt as a slave. Joseph went from being the favored son to being a slave in Egypt, a slave in Potiphar's household. But you know what? Joseph continued to use the gifts and the talents that God had given him, no matter what the context was. And in Potiphar's household, I believe that Joseph had the gift of wise administration. And in Potiphar's household, he began to use that gift in managing the resources for Potiphar on his behalf. Let's pick up the story here in Genesis 39, verse 4. When Joseph is in Potiphar's household, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he entrusted to his care everything he owned. So Joseph went from being favored son to being slave in Egypt to being the head of Potiphar's household. Despite the circumstances, he continued to use the gifts that God had given to him. But that's not the end of the story. As is true in most of our lives, there's lots of ups and downs. Joseph was about to face another challenge, and that was Potiphar's wife. From day one, she was trying to get him into bed with her. And he continued to resist, he resisted, he resisted. Well, one day, during the same cycle where she was trying to get him into bed with her, he fled, and he left behind his robe. So Potiphar's wife decided to use that against him. And she took his robe and she said, See, you, this slave you have left in our household had tried to attack me. See what you have done to me? See what has happened? And so Potiphar, in his fury, threw Joseph into prison. So Joseph went from being favored son to being slave in Egypt to being head of household to being a prisoner in Egypt. Again, the ups and downs. But even while he was in prison, the gift of wise administration came through again for Joseph. Let's look at chapter 39, the latter part of verse 20. But when Joseph was there in the prison... The Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison. And he was made responsible for all that was done there. Again, Joseph rises up using the gifts and the talents that God has given him. While he was in prison, he met two people, a baker and a cupbearer of Pharaoh's. They both had dreams. 
Joseph was given the gift of interpretation for those dreams, and he let the baker know that in three days, his dream interpreted would mean that he would be killed. And the cupbearer, in three days, would mean that he'd be restored to Pharaoh's table. So he said to the cupbearer, remember me when you're restored to Pharaoh's table. Help me get out of this prison. Remember me. So the cupbearer is restored after three days to Pharaoh's table, but forgets all about Joseph. It's another two years of Joseph being in prison before the cupbearer brings back to his memory what Joseph had done for him when Pharaoh has some dreams that nobody can interpret. The cupbearer says, Pharaoh, there was a man in prison that interpreted my dream, and it came to pass just as he said. So they called, they called Joseph out of, out of the prison to Pharaoh's table, and Pharaoh shared with him the dreams. And Joseph was able to interpret the dreams that the first dream, that there would be seven years of plenty, and then seven years of famine. And that God had given Pharaoh those dreams for the specific purpose that during the seven years of plenty, they could store up and be prepared for the seven years of famine. Pharaoh recognized, Dave, recognized Joseph's gift of a wise administration. Let's look at chapter 41, verse 39. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one so discerning and wise as you. You shall be in charge of my palace, and all of my people are submit to submit to your orders. Only with respect to the throne will I be greater than you. Joseph dealt with a lot of different life circumstances. He went from being favored son to being slave in Egypt, head of Potiphar's house, prisoner in Egypt, and then second in command of all of Egypt. And in each situation, he used the gifts and talents that God had given to him. The message here is to persevere through life's struggles. You know, at the beginning of my message, I shared with you that God has really been working on me in the last six months, doing a real clarifying, refining process. And as I reflect back on it, it really has been much longer than that. God has been really working on me for a long time. A real turning point for me was back in April of 2000. Things were going really good in my life. My husband and I were celebrating a very special anniversary. Not a wedding anniversary, but actually an anniversary that he had been five years cancer-free. You see, in 1995, he had battled non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And so we had, for five years, lived with bated breath, wondering if it would come back again. And in five years, after five years, he was given a clean bill of health. Many of the doctors say, actually, after five years, they consider you cured. The chance of reoccurrence after five years is very, very small. We were really excited. My husband had just finished his uh, certificate in marriage and family therapy, and we were planning to be able to do ministry together with couples and families. We purchased our first home together, and we were really excited about getting started on that. We were planning to have children. We wanted to have another baby, and we felt like we could make that decision now that he had been five years cancer-free. Only two short months later, in June of 2000, my husband noticed a lump on his neck. He went into the doctor, and after a biopsy, and after CAT scans, and all of the tests that they do, we found that his lymphoma had returned. I was devastated. I was angry. Our life became way more about doctor visits and medicines and trying to learn all about this thing we were going to have to go, to, go through. The doctors actually said the treatment that he was going to have to go through this time would be like an atomic bomb in comparison to the firecracker he'd experienced in 1995. So we geared up for the worst because we knew it was going to be tough. But I began to get really angry, really angry at God because I thought I understood our purpose. I thought I knew what our life was supposed to be, and it was all falling apart, and I didn't understand it. I even questioned if maybe I didn't hear God. Maybe I was the one who was confused. But God began showing me something. As I was caring for my husband, as I was going through that journey, that process, God began to show me how he was using my gifts, my gifts of mercy and compassion as I cared for my husband during all of the difficulties that he had to go through. He showed me how he was using my gifts of exhortation and encouragement as I started an email list and began sending out updates about the great things that God was doing for us. There were so many miracles, countless miracles of God's hand in our life during those days, and I felt compelled to share them with people because you see that as part of who I am. I couldn't keep my mouth closed. It was part of the way that God designed me. I started an email list that grew to about 100 people. It got forwarded all over the world. It was translated into Spanish, put on websites in South America, all because I just, that's who I am. I couldn't help it. God was using my gifts of exhortation and encouragement. 
God also showed me how he was using my gifts of administration as I managed medications and I managed doctor visits and I managed childcare for my kids. All of that to try and bring stability to my family during an extremely chaotic time of our life. God helped me to find my purpose in the midst of my life's struggles, in the midst of my life's circumstances. After 18 months of going through this, Kevin went home to be with Jesus. And I felt like my world fell apart again. The rug had been pulled out from under me. I didn't know what my purpose was anymore. I had my whole purpose had been wrapped up in what I had been doing. I couldn't even send any emails anymore. I was just lost. And you know what? I just want to be out loud about the fact that when you go through struggles, when you go through tragedies, and when you experience that kind of loss and that kind of a grief, it's okay to be confused. It's normal to be confused. It's normal to feel lost and like you don't have a purpose. But know that God does have a purpose for you. In spite of how you feel, in spite of the circumstances, God does have one, and he will take you on a journey of healing. God has taken me through an incredible journey of healing, a process of just restoring and helping me define my purpose. He brought into my life somebody to share my dreams with, and last August I was married again to a wonderful man. A man who is helping me to discover what my dreams are, and helping me on the process and the journey I've been going through in the last six months, he's been my cheerleader and my advocate, and helping me to understand how God has designed me and what my purpose is. He's my greatest supporter, and I am thankful for him. You know, the process I've gone through over the last six months, it has been incredibly clarifying and refining of all that God has been building in me for the last five years or more. And I have learned so much by going through and teaching this Discover Your Gifts class God has just seared into my heart the importance of understanding and discovering our unique design, that label designed by Christ, helping me understand what he has created me to be. The book that we use for that class is that the foundation has been this Life Keys book. I, we are offering a class at the end of August and again in September. If any of you feel like, I'm not sure what my gifts are, I'm not sure how God has uniquely designed me, the class is great. This book is great. It takes you through all the exercises that you would need to help understand yourself a little bit better. And after I've learned more about myself, my gifts, my understanding, God has been really helping me to define, to write down what is my mission, what is my purpose, and how does everything in my life get filtered through that. I think all of us need a mission. Someday I hope to have as clear of a mission as Jesus had in John 10.10, 10, that I can in one sentence tell you what God has created me to be and what my purpose is here on earth. I'm still working on that. I haven't quite gotten there yet, but I am working on that because I believe that we need that level of focus in order to be able to get on track with what God has for us. One of the books that I'm using to help me write my mission statement is called The Path. And it's a great book that's concrete about how to write down what God has uniquely designed you to do and how you can then measure everything in your life up against that. You see, having a mission can keep us focused. Having people in our life that can advocate for us, identify our gifts for us, being a part of a small group can be critical to being able to fulfill the kingdom purpose that God has, to you, has for you. I would like to close with reading a story. It's actually my son's story. It's called The Tale of Three Trees, and it is a children's story. And it's the book my son is never going to get back because I like it way too much, and I use it way too much. Um, I think it's an incredibly impactful story. You're going to see the pictures on the screen as I read through the story called Tale of Three Trees. Once upon a mountaintop, three trees stood and dreamed of what they wanted to become when they grew up. The first little tree looked up at the stars twinkling like diamonds above him. I want to hold treasure, he said. I want to be covered with gold and filled with precious stones. I will be the most beautiful treasure chest in the world. The second little tree looked out at the small stream trickling by on its way to the ocean. I want to be a strong sailing ship, he said. I want to travel mighty waters and carry powerful kings. I will be the strongest ship in the world. The third little tree looked down into the valley below where the busy men and the busy women worked in a busy town. I don't want to leave this mountaintop at all, she said. 
I want to grow so tall that when people stop to look at me, they will raise their eyes to heaven and think of God. I will be the tallest tree in the world. Years passed, the rains came, the sun shone, and the little trees grew tall. One day, three woodcutters climbed the mountain. The first woodcutter looked at the first tree and said, this tree is beautiful, it's perfect for me. And with the swoop of his shining ax, the first tree fell. Now I shall be made into a beautiful chest, thought the first tree. I shall hold wonderful treasure. The second woodcutter looked at the second tree and said, this tree is strong and it is perfect for me. With the swoop of his shining ax, the second tree fell. Now I shall sail mighty waters, thought the second tree. I shall be a strong ship fit for kings. The third tree felt her heart sink when the last woodcutter looked her way. She stood straight and tall and bravely pointed to the heaven, but the woodcutter never even looked up. Any kind of tree will do for me, he muttered, and with a swoop of his shining axe, the third tree fell. The first tree rejoiced when the woodcutter brought him to a carpenter shop. But the busy carpenter was not thinking about treasure chests. Instead, his work-worn hands fashioned the tree into a feed box for animals. The once beautiful tree was not covered with gold or filled with treasure. He was coated with sawdust and filled with hay for hungry farm animals. The second tree smiled when the woodcutter took him to a shipyard. But no mighty sailing ships were being made that day. Instead, the once strong tree was hammered and sawed into a simple fishing boat. Too small and too weak to sail an ocean or even a river, he was taken to a little lake. Every day, he brought in loads of dead, smelly fish. The third tree was confused when the woodcutter took her, cut her into strong beams and left her in a lumber yard. What happened, the once tall tree wondered. All I ever wanted to do was stay on the mountaintop and point to God. Many, many days and nights passed. The three trees nearly forgot their dreams. But one night, golden starlight poured over the first tree as a young woman placed her newborn baby in the feed box. I wish I could make a cradle for him, her husband whispered. The mother squeezed his hand and smiled as the starlight shone on the smooth and sturdy wood. This manger is beautiful, she said. And suddenly the first tree knew he was holding the greatest treasure in the world. One evening, a tired traveler and his friends crowded onto the old fishing boat. The traveler fell asleep as the second tree quietly sailed out onto the lake. Soon a thundering and thrashing storm arose. The little tree shuddered. He knew he did not have the strength to carry many passengers safely through the wind and the rain. The tired man awakened. He stood up, stretched out his hand, and said, peace. The storm stopped as quickly as it had begun, and suddenly the second tree knew he was carrying the king of, Kevin, of heaven and earth. One Friday morning, the third tree was startled when her beams were yanked from the wooden pile. She flinched as she was carried through an angry, jeering crowd. She shuddered when the soldiers nailed a man's hands to her. She felt ugly and harsh and cruel. But on Sunday morning, when the sun rose and the earth trembled with joy beneath her, the third tree knew that God's love had changed everything. It had made the first tree beautiful, and it had made the second tree strong. And every time people thought of the third tree, they would think of God. And that was better than being the tallest tree in the world. Life has a way of changing things. Our dreams mostly don't turn out the way we thought they would. But the reality is, is that God still has a kingdom purpose for us. And we need to stand firm against the obstacles, and be true to how God has made us just like Ruth was, and persevere through life's struggles, because they will come. I will experience more tragedies in my life. They will come. But I want to know my purpose, and I want to stay focused on what God has for me. I'd like the altar workers to come forward, and I'd like to invite you to come forward for prayer today if you would like to have some prayer. 
Maybe you don't feel like you have a purpose. Maybe you have never, ever asked Jesus into your heart and started a relationship with him. And maybe you don't even have that kingdom purpose because you've never been redeemed by his great mercy. I invite you to come forward and pray with someone today and experience what it's like to have that kingdom purpose. Maybe life struggles and the obstacles that you've faced have gotten you off track and you just need prayer and support to surround you during the, your journey as you take it. I invite you to come forward and pray. I'm going to close this in prayer. Lord Jesus, I just thank you for the kingdom purpose that you've given to each of us and the plan that you have for us. Lord, there are no nobodies in the kingdom. All we have to do is be willing and say yes. So Lord, just like Mary, we say here am I, Lord. Let it be as you say in my life, Lord. We want to just surrender our plans, our dreams, our hopes, Lord Jesus, to you. Fulfill your purpose in us, Lord. Take us on that journey. Let us walk the way you want us to walk. Let us walk your path, Lord. In your name I pray, Jesus. Amen.